Hello and welcome to Mainly for Men, and as the title implies, this is a programme, fellas, just for you. For the next half an hour, we've got some very interesting items lined up for you. For instance, we've got some new inventions to show you on the automobile. Then we have uh, a very exciting piece on shark fishing and a few delectable damsels scattered all over the place. Now, take this one. She's not the moving variety, but she is a very famous young lady called Venus de Milo. Uh, a little bit plump for me, although she had a few Romans getting a bit hot under the old toga round about uh, the 4th century. But ideal woman-wise, she's uh, not my cup of tea. Talking of ideal women, we thought it'd be a good idea if we asked four eminent men about women who they thought the girl most likely for them. And first of all, here's actor-singer Paul Jones. I suppose really everybody's rules start with basic sexual attraction. Uh, but there are qualifying factors even in that. I don't mean to say that... Um, you know, I can't find anybody sexually attractive unless first I find their mind extremely interesting. I mean, that would be far too precious. It's just that um, I have to sort of feel that somebody would be interesting. You know, one has to talk afterwards and so on. And David Bailey, the ideal woman for you. An ideal woman? Well, that's sort of difficult because I think Every woman's sort of my ideal woman. I mean, they're all lovely. Some are just lovelier than others. I mean, some women physically are marvellous when they're long, tall and skinny, and others with big tits. And I mean, there's different types of women. I mean, it's like an ideal car. I mean, there's no such thing as an ideal car because a Rolls Royce has got qualities that a Ferrari doesn't. I think that the sort of Ideal woman should be like a fella. I mean, the more, the more tweaky they are, the more liable they're, to, they're liable to go wrong, like Ferraris. I think an ideal woman should go along with you. Preferring the looks of home to away, footballer Georgie Best. I think the most beautiful girls in the world are definitely the English. Uh, I've been almost well everywhere in the world, and uh, I would say they're definitely the English girls are the best looking. Yeah, I prefer them to have uh, long legs, very long, uh, nice, nice shapely legs. Uh, I don't like makeup, so I should uh, have to wear hardly any at all. As it is now, fashions change so quickly and so often. I'd like her to change with them and not sort of lag behind. I'd like to pick some of her clothes as well. Well, not pick them, but have a, a bit of a say in what she wears. And I'd like her to do the same with me. All in all, she's going to have to lead a pretty hectic life. So as far as I'm concerned, she's going to be, she's going to have to be really, really something. Something on the subject now from model agent Gavin Robinson. When you're out, everybody turns around and looks at her and you're very proud. And yet when you're at home, she's just like dear old mum. She doesn't cook like mum, of course, because men are the best cooks. If you think of the famous models of today and the famous beauties, without their makeup and their hair pieces, as I don't suppose they would be an ideal woman. They'd all be plain and simple and attractive like most of us men, I suppose.
and very nice too. It's the only way to do the dusting, I can tell you that. Now then, these days we're finding ourselves with much more leisure time on our hands. What to do with it all? Well, there are lots and lots of things we can do. One thing is the increasingly popular sport of shark fishing. We sent our Mainly for Men team down to the south coast of England to find out all about it. The fishing village of Lou in Cornwall. And every day during the season, a couple of dozen boats put out from here to go shark fishing. This is the headquarters of the Shark Angling Club of Great Britain. It was founded 15 years ago, and since then, there have been 56,000 sharks landed at Lou. The 498 pound one you see there is a British record. Raymond Pengelly, our skipper for the day, is the man that brought it in. The trip out is about 15 to 16 miles. The cost of the boat for the day is 12 pounds, complete with skipper and bait and tackle. That's the Edison. The bag is full of decomposing pilchards, and it's called politely rubby-dubby. You'll see the use in a moment. And this is the bait, pilchards again, in salt. Over the side goes the rubby-dubby bag. As soon as the boat has stopped, swish it about in the water, allowing the oil and bits of flesh to drift back along your course. This attracts the sharks. Bait the hook up with two pilchards, usually. Then over the side with it, and pay out the line until the cork float is drifting about 60 feet away from the boat. Then the tourist piece, in goes a halfpenny from the skipper, so say, to buy a shark. Then comes the long wait. At least we hope it's not too long. Ours wasn't. It's a very pleasant way to spend the afternoon. The sun shining, the boat bobbing. And then the sound of the line coming out from the river. The moment you hear that, you know that the battle is on. And it is a battle. Ours was quite a small shark, so Raymond Pengilly said, but my arms were nearly pulled out of their sockets several times. And it's quite a long fight. You see, he's wearing a glove. This is to protect him from the rough skin of the shark and also from the teeth, which would take his hand off. Over the side goes the gaff into the shark's jaw, and he pulls it aboard. Everybody scatters. When you've caught a shark, you're then entitled to fly a yellow flag. This one below a blue one, meaning that it's too small to weigh, in fact, about 45 pounds. It's an exciting day out, a pleasant way to spend the day. And if you're feeling down in the mouth, why not try it? Certainly a sport you can uh, get your teeth into. Dave over there gave me that line, and was he glad to get rid of it? Now then, we come to our girl of the week. She's a fashion model. She's 34, 24, 34, and... Here she is now, 34, and here she is now, Penny Yates. Can we have a reading, please, Jenny? Great sound, Jenny. 16. <coughs> 16. Right, Penny. Now, I want you to look very oriental. Faster. Okay, let's go. Good. On tiptoe, let it go higher. Good. Yeah, yeah, good. Head up. Good. There, there, let it go. Great. More, let it go faster. The whole thing faster. Great. Let your mouth fall open like that. Marvelous. Yeah, there, 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 there. Good. Good. And again. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. As a frequent user of the road, I'm all in favour of any ideas that incorporate safety, make driving more comfortable and more courteous. We've had a few such ideas sent in to mainly for men, and I'd like to bring them to your notice right now. The first one deals with that inconsiderate driver who comes up behind you at night with his headlights at full beam, blinding you. 
from your rear view mirror. Now, uh, we can counteract this at the moment with a mirror which we can operate by hand to change the angle of it so we don't uh, get dazzled. But now here's one that uh, works automatically and allows us to keep both hands on the steering wheel. Very uh, good safety factor. And it operates this way. We have a small photoelectric cell situated in the top left-hand corner of the mirror. This activates a little box of tricks which is fixed underneath the bonnet. This in turn allows the manifold vacuum to take the air out of bellows which are situated behind the mirror. As it takes the air out of the bellows, the mirror is then tilted backwards and consequently the glare is taken away from your eyes. Now when the car has passed you, the light intensity decreases, the uh, bellows fill up with air again and the mirror returns to its normal position. Now for courteous driving. How many of us have been behind a lorry, a big lorry? We can't pass him until the kind driver in the lorry gives us a signal and tells us that all is clear. We get past and how do we thank him? Do we flash our lights? Do we turn around and do we wave? If we do, we might uh, stand the risk of running into something. By the time we've decided we are miles ahead and it's uh, not worth worrying about anyway. But we'd like to thank him and we have uh, a device here which does just that. It's an illuminated sign in the back of the car operated by a switch underneath the dashboard. We pull out the switch after we pass the lorry after his signal and uh, the light flashes on and off and says many thanks. Now I do this uh, at the moment and uh, all the uh, lorry drivers who uh, actually saw it would probably run into the ditch with surprise. So lorry drivers who are watching, be prepared. This might well be the thing of the future. I hope it is. I think it's a very good idea. Actually, the uh, mind boggles at the number of messages one could uh, put in the back of the window. I think this is the, uh, the best one, though. If you have any ideas uh, which would uh, lead to greater safety, more comfortable or more courteous driving, we'd like to hear, th hear of them. Uh, so do drop us a line uh, to this program, mainly for men, BBC Bristol 8. And uh, for your ideas, which we'll pass on to designers in advance, many thanks. Well, that's it. I'm afraid there's no time for any more. But I hope you found something in this program to interest you. And don't forget, fellas, if there's anything you want to see, well, uh, do drop us a line with your suggestions. And if they're not too impossible, we'll do our very best to bring them to the screen for you. Now, I'm going to leave you tonight with something soothing and cool a girl and a song and with them both i wish you very pleasant dreams good night You